Okay, so welcome to the Bioxcel webinar. Today, webinar is number 79, and it will be about PDB resource to help with starting model selection for molecular dynamic simulation. So our speaker from today is uh, Sudachina Kanguri from uh, the European Bioinformatics Institute that is located in UK, Cambridge. I'm Alessandra Villa and I host uh, this webinar together with Otto Anderson. We are both from Bioxcel, that is a center of excellence for computational bimolecular research. This webinar will be recorded, and then after the uh, webinar will be posted on the BioXL YouTube channel. During the webinar, you have the opportunity to ask questions. And you, to do that, you can use the Q&A function that is at the bottom of the Zoom application. Depending on which operating system you have, you might see this symbol or this symbol. You just click and you type your question. And let us know if you have or not a microphone. At the end of the webinar, I will unmute you so you can ask yourself the question to the speaker. Or if you don't have a microphone, I will just read the question for you. So after the, you still have a question after the webinar, you can go to the forum, askbyyourself.eu. And there, there is a dedicated category for the webinar, for the Bioxcel webinar. And in particular, for each webinar, we have a dedicated directory. So here you find the, you see the link for this webinar. And there, Sudachina, but also Adam and Marcus, there are colleagues for her. They will answer to your question. They will be available for one week from now. So something about the presenter of today. Sudafina completed her PhD in India, in, in particular in Bose Institute. And is, the PhD was on structural determination and biophysical characterization of nucleic acid and ligand complex. Then she moved for a doctoral study in the Clemson University, USA. And there she was working on RNA, aminoglucid antibiotics. In 2023, she joined the TB, uh, PDBE team in ABI, and she's working as scientific data curator. So in particular, her work involves annotation and curation of preliminary PDB and EMDB, submission and extraction of relevant biological information. And she's also part of the training and outreach team, of course, collected to PDBE. With, uh, together with uh, uh, Sudachina today, there are two other people. There were supposed to be two other people, but uh, today we have only one because the other might join later, but might not. It depends on weather conditions. So uh, Marcus is with us. You can see him uh, in the video. And uh, he has done his PhD in computational biology at the University of Dundee. And in particular, work on mammalia, messenger RNA capping enzyme using molecular dynamic simulation. Then he joined after his PhD in, 20, in 2022, uh, ABI as a bioinformatician, and he's working also in the PDB team. And in particular, he's responsible for standardizing the representation of protein modification in the archive. Uh, maybe also we will have also join us Adam. Adam is coming from uh, from the Université Paris Cité, and he was work. He did his PhD in the molecular dynamics of antibiotic antibodies. Sorry, then he joined ABI and he's still a member of the PDBE team. His work center mainly on interoperability and integration of structural molecular dynamics data and is involved also in another European project that called MDDB. And uh, so both Marcus and Adam are here to answer to your question together with Sudacina. Thank you, welcome to both of them, uh, to all three of them. And then 
I, I'm finished to introduce for the introduction and I will stop sharing and Sudachina can start her presentation, please. Thanks for the introduction, Alessandra. Um, okay, can you see my slides? And you're hearing me fine? Yes, very well. Thank you. Um, I'll just keep my camera off during the talk because I tend to move my hands around a lot during when I speak and I don't want you to see that. Um, so yes, uh, good afternoon. And I'm going to be talking about PDBE resources to help with starting model selection for MD simulations. Um, OK. I'm sure you're all aware about what an MD simulation is. I don't want to go into details. But what is really interesting is that every MD simulation has to start from a starting model. Now, this may be an experimental model, which you can get from the PDB, or it may actually be a computational model that you can get from, say, AlphaFold or any other software. So selecting the correct starting model is actually really, really important for a successful MD simulation. So why is a starting model important? Um, is there any example where different models can lead to different results? The answer is yes, it can. Um, for example, these two proteins um, are, they're basically the same protein. They have the same uniprot um, ID, but if they have quite different structures. So if you start simulations using these two distinct proteins, they would probably result in very different um, final trajectories or final models. So it's essential that you select something, select a starting model that is actually appropriate. So what will be the takeaway? What are you going to learn from this seminar? First and foremost, you are going to see or learn where and how do you search for a structure. You are going to understand what validation metrics are and what they mean. We are also going to show you different methods to visualize and compare structures in the PDB. And finally, I'm going to talk about using existing MD frames as an initial structure. Right. So now that you have an idea of what you can expect, I'm going to dive into what the WWPDB is. In case you don't know, the Worldwide Protein Data Bank is a consortium of different members. Um, and we are all located in different continents geographically. Um, RCSP PDB and BMRB, which is the Biomolecular Magnetic Resonance Data Bank, uh, it deals with the um, experimental data archive for NMR experiments. So these partners are based in North America. Um, PDBE and EMDB, which is the Electron Microscopy Data Bank, we are based in Europe. More specifically in the UK, we are based in Hingston, which is right outside of Cambridge. And we also have PDB Japan, uh, which is our member, our associate, one of our uh, members in based in Japan in Osaka University. So all of these different um, databases and archives, they come together uh, and form what is known as the Worldwide Protein Data Bank. And we all store the same information, but the different sites will add different metadata uh, or different annotations, which are specific. Now, a little idea about statistics. Um, as of today, there are more than 220,000 structures um, in the protein data bank. So as you can see, there's a lot of information out there. Um, and you really need to know how to cut through the noise and get to what you're actually looking for. Um, and this is very, very important. So what would you say are the important points for selecting a starting model? Now, there are several points which you should keep in mind, you should be aware of when selecting a starting model. Um, and I'm going to go through each of these in details. The first, of course, is the resolution for the model. 
So what exactly is the resolution? Um, resolution is especially important in case of X-ray crystal structures and also cryo-EM derived models. But what does resolution actually mean? Let's take a look. So as you can see, this is um, the coordinates have been modeled in this electron density. But as you can see, it's this is at a 3.7 angstrom resolution. And um, it's very clear that this is more of a blob where the side chains, you cannot really make out um, very specific information about the side chains at this resolution. The same structure, the same coordinates at a 2.4 angstrom resolution. I'm sure you can see it looks much better. Um, the electron density, you can actually make out uh, the individual side chains from right over here. At a higher resolution, say at 1.5 angstrom, um, you can actually see the aromatic rings much more clearly. These are the central regions does not have any electron density. And uh, I would say this is a, you would have much more confidence in a model that is built at a 1.5 angstrom resolution than say at 3.7 angstrom resolution. And finally, this is a model which is super high resolution at 0 0.8 angstrom. At this resolution, you can actually start seeing the hydrogens. So it's super, super high resolution. But one thing to bear in mind is if a structure has a very high resolution, say 0 0.8 angstrom, it may also indicate that the structure is very stable. It's not very flexible. So that may mean that um, an empty simulation may not lead to as much information or as much flexibility or movement as you may be expecting. So this is something that you should be aware of. You want to select a structure at a high resolution, but again, you should take a closer look if there's an active site or a ligand binding site that you are interested in. You want to make sure that this regions um, are not extremely stable so that there are no changes over the simulation. It depends on a case to case um, basis. Right, so moving on, um, the next point that you should always remember or check for is, are there any outstanding steric clashes within the structure? Um, you do not want to start with a model where there are already existing clashes in the starting model, um, because these will probably be carried on during the simulation. So how do you check if a structure has a steric clash? One easy way to do this is suppose if you have, this is the PDBE web page, the entry page. And on our entry page, you have this tab, which is called the 3D visualization tab. When you click on it, you get this view, which is our molecular uh, viewer called Molestar. And on Molestar, there is this really um, important functionality called validation module where you can actually color your structure based on specific issues. Um, for example, you can color it by clashes and it'll show you exactly where in the structure you can expect clashes. Um, if you zoom into any particular region, you can, you can actually see uh, overlaid with the electron density or the map for a cryo-EM entry and try to find out which are the atoms that are actually clashing against each other. If this is in a region which is close to say your region of interest, then you would probably not want to start with this particular structure. Um, okay, the next point would be to assess whether water molecules should be kept in the structure or if they should be stripped. So for example, this particular PDBID, um, the water molecules, maybe none of them are very functional or they are in the active side. You could probably strip all of them before you start your MD simulation. However, in certain cases, for example, this particular PDBID, um, the water molecule is interacting um, with uh, an important metal ion. So if there are any water molecules which are um, coordinating with metal ions or which are maybe in the active site, um, and they may have functional roles, you would not want to strip those particular molecules. So again, based on where you're looking or what you're interested to look at, it is a good idea to assess whether you want to strip every water molecule or keep some of them in the structure. 
So the next point is, are there any missing regions or loops of the protein? Uh, and do they have to be modeled using another tool? For example, uh, for this particular PDB, there's one loop that has not been modeled. Perhaps the depositors or the authors could not see any electron density for this particular region. Or for whatever reason, they were not able to model it. Um, you would not want to start with any structure that has regions missing uh, in the initial structure. Of course, if this is a region that's that will in no way affect your ligand binding or the active site, then maybe you could also model this using a different tool and uh, use it. But again, depending on your case, this is something to always keep in mind. I would also like to point out um, exactly where you can find the information about missing atoms. So in the MMC file, um, there's one particular loop, which is called the unobserved or zero occupancy residues. That will give you information about any, um, any particular residues uh, that have not been modeled. Similarly, in the validation report, uh, any residues that are unobserved, unmodeled, will be shown in gray. So if you see any, this is sort of a, like a cheat code where if there are any residues colored in gray, you know they are not modeled in the final structure. And I'll talk more about this uh, later on in the talk. The next point is, what is the confirmation of the protein? So, for example, um, if it's an apple versus the hollow form. So both of these uh, proteins are the serine protease one. They have the same uniprot ID, but one of them have a ligand bound to it. So as you can understand, they, there are some differences, significant differences in the apple versus the hollow form. So again, depending on uh, what you are looking for, uh, if you want a ligand binding site, um, you should be aware of what form of the protein that you're using as an initial model to start um, your simulation. And the final point, of course, is what is the experimental method used to derive the structure? Currently in the PDB, there are three experimental methods um, where most of the uh, structures solved are using these three experimental methods. We, of course, have electron X-ray crystallography. We have cryo-EM spectroscopy, and you have NMR. And all of these have different experimental data associated with the models. Uh, it's always a good idea to view the model overlaid with the experimental data to really understand how um, good the modeling is. For example, in case of um, X-ray crystallography, um, you can overlay the, the coordinates with the electron density, and you can actually see if the electron density supports the modeling of the coordinates that the depositors have provided us. And also, I would just like to point out that these different colors, they all have different meanings. So if you have red density, it means um, more coordinates have been modeled in this region than is supported by the experimental data. So it's an overfit. Whereas in case of green, it's just the opposite. That is, there is electron density, but nothing has been modeled in this region. Whereas blue would indicate perfect fit or correct fit, that no over or under fit. In case of um, cryo-EM, of course, you have the map density. The map uh, should cover the, uh, should support the modeling of the coordinates. And in case of NMR spectroscopy, you always get an ensemble of structures. You would have multiple structures and you need to make sure that um, the RMSD or the deviation between the different structures is not too high. All of these, um, the structures should be very similar to each other. Okay, so now that you are aware of the different um, points that you should keep into consideration when you're selecting a structure, and you suppose you want to know how good uh, or how well the structure is modeled. Um, there is something that we show on our pages, which is called validation sliders. I'm sure you must have um, must be aware or must have seen these validation sliders. But what do these exactly tell you? What is the meaning? Uh, and why are these important in terms of any any coordinate, any structure deposited in the PDB? 
Um, you can download the validation sliders right from here. You can download the validation report. You can also view it um, right from this tab, which is called the Downloads tab on our entry pages. Um, now, since I'm on the topic of file download, I'm just going to point out um, that there is something called a PDB file, and we also are distributing the MMCIF file. Now, the PDB format is no longer being supported. Uh, we are actively moving towards the MMCIF format, which is now our new master format. This is because PDB formats, um, they are fixed column width uh, formats, and they therefore it has it is much less information dense than MMCIF format. We can provide a lot more information in the MMCIF format as compared to the PDB format. So if you're used to using PDB files and you don't really know much about the MMCIF files, um, we highly recommend that you download the MMCIF files and familiarize yourself with it. Uh, there's a lot of information available. We have this really comprehensive MMCIF user guide, um, and we're always looking for feedback. So if you have any questions, any comments about the MMCIF um, format, please feel free to reach out to us. Okay. So heading on, um, validation sliders, they give you an idea about the overall quality of the structure, the assessment of the quality of modeling compared to the number of um, validation metrics, and it includes geometric validation as well as fit of the model to the experimental data. That is how well is the model, it's, the coordinates are modeled and if the coordinates uh, are in line with the actual experimental data. So take a look at these three um, validation sliders and what which one would you say has a higher quality? Just take a look at this. And I think it's very evident that this one is extremely high quality, the first one, because all of the validation metrics are in the blue zone. Um, they have higher values. Whereas 5OVO, well, some of these, um, there are clashes present, and um, but some of the values, the validation metrics are high. So this is a medium quality um, of modeling. Whereas in case of 3LNN, as you can see, almost all of the metrics are in the red zone, which probably will show that there are potential issues in the structure. So that is why validation sliders are important. They will tell you at a glance if there is any outstanding issue uh, in the structure. But I will also tell you what each of these uh, metric individually, what do they mean? Um, so R3, the first metric that we show is R3, which measures the correlation between observed structure factor and calculated from the model. So higher the R3, lower the quality. So you want less of an R3. But I would like to point out that R3 is very specific for X-ray diffraction entries. So this will be reported only for X-ray diffraction entries, not for anything else. Clash score, of course, um, indicates the number of close contacts between atoms. Um, and uh, as is very evident, as the clash score increases, quality decreases, you want as less number of clashes in the structure as possible. The next slider, of course, is Ramachandran outliers, uh, where a residue, the backbone torsion angle values, if they fall outside of allowed regions, we would classify that as a Ramachandran outlier. Again, lower number of outliers, higher the quality of modeling. Side chain outliers, again, the torsion angles for the side chains, if they fall outside of a particular allowed region, uh, you would consider that as an outlier. And lower number of outliers would indicate a higher quality of the structure. And finally, you have RSRZ outliers, which quantify deviation of bond angles and bond lengths in standard residues. And lower number would signify a higher quality. So except R3, um, all the other metrics are reported for structures determined using any of the three methods. So you will always get these validation metrics for the different structures um, using different methods. But in case of cryo-EM structures, which is what I'm going to discuss next, there are certain validation metrics um, that you need to be more aware of. 
which determine how well the modeling of a cryo-EM structure is. So in case of EM structures, um, we use something that's called atom inclusion plot. You would find this in the uh, validation report for every cryo-EM structure. And what this is actually showing you is it, dis it is displaying graphically the fraction of atoms that fit within the map at different contour levels. So this is basically this red line is the contour level. But remember that this is the recommended contour level, and this comes from the depositor. So this is what they um, provide at deposition. And um, atom inclusion is highly, highly dependent on the contour level. We'll see in a second. For example, this is the same structure, but at a contour level of 0 0.2, it's just basically noise. Moving on, at a contour level of one, which is, if you remember what the depositors had recommended, you can see that the map covers most of the model coordinates, so it's it's very accurate. And finally, at a contour level of two, you can see that the map does not support the modeling of these coordinates at all. So the atom inclusion is one of the properties highly dependent on the contour level, and therefore we do not recommend looking at only um, atom inclusion, sorry, uh, at only this particular uh, criteria as a data quality for EM. So what do we propose you look at instead of um, atom inclusion? Before I go into that, it's important to understand the concept of global versus local resolution for cryo-EM structures. For example, for this particular PDB, um, the outside the um, the portions of the map, which are at the very ends, they are they have a much higher resolution. Um, sorry, I would say a much lower resolution or a higher value of resolution as compared to the center central part of the map. And um, this just say, shows that some parts of the map have better resolution than other parts of the map, depending on the flexibility of the different regions. Right now, what we report for EM structures is the global resolution. We do not really report the local resolution for the structures. But this is why the Q scores are extremely important. So the Q score is calculated directly from map values around an atom's position. So it's a direct reflection of uh, the map values or the local resolution. So the higher the Q score, uh, the better is the modeling of the coordinates corresponding to the map. And again, this is reported in the validation metrics uh, for every, every structure, every cryo-EM structure. Alternatively, if you go to the EMDB website, which is the Electron Microscopy Data Bank website, on their entry pages, you would find something that's called the evaluation bar, and it will give you the Q score. Um, just like we give out the PDBE validation metrics. So um, the lower value of a Q-score, as you can see over here, it just says that the map does not really support the modeling of the coordinates in this case. It's very different. The Q-score is very low. Whereas in case of uh, high values of the Q-score, the map really supports the building or the modeling of the coordinates. So Q-score is a really good uh, way you can find out um, how good the modeling of the coordinates is for cryo-EM structures. And we recommend you look at Q-score if you're looking at cryo-EM. OK, so now that you know what you should be aware of um, when you're selecting a starting model, you know the different validation metrics to determine for yourself um, if it's a good versus not such a good structure. Is there a way that you can visualize these structures and compare them to find something that you are looking for specifically? We have a resource which is called PDBEKB or the PDBE Knowledge Base, which will allow you to compare structures present in the PDB. So if you go to our entry page, um, for every entry, we you would have this tab, which is called the PDBEKB. And if you click on it, this leads you to our KB page. And what it's telling you basically is that this particular protein with this Uniprot ID is present in four structures all over the PDB. In these four structures, there are eight ligands which are bound to it. So it's giving you a compact view or a holistic view of the protein um, in the PDB. 
all the different instances of this protein being reported in the PDB. We also have a representative structure, um, which we show right over here, and that is based on the particular PDB ID with the highest data quality, coverage, and resolution. So I'm going to go into details um, for this particular page called the PDB, uh, EKB. For example, for the serine threonin protein kinase mTOR, um, the first tab tells you that there are 50 structures in the PDB with this protein. If you click on it, you get this view where you will get a list of all the different PDB IDs um, where this particular protein is presented. Uh, sorry, uh, where this particular protein is present. And it will also show you um, the region of the protein. It will give you information about domain information, um, about different. Um, so you just need to scroll down the page and play with it a little to really understand um, the different information available for all these different PDB IDs. I'm also going to show you what this button does, which is called the 3D view of superposed ligands. Uh, superposed, sorry, this is not the ligand. 3D view of superposed structures. So if you click on this one, um, what it actually shows you is the structural clusters of the protein. So it's basically showing you a superposed view of all the different um, PDB IDs where this particular protein is present. And it has also done its clustering where it tells you how many unique clusters there are. Another really interesting um, function is that if you have any predicted alpha fold structure, that is, you can also load that um, onto your view. And this really helps you understand if there's any particular instance of the protein in the PDB where it is significantly different due to whatever reasons, maybe crystallization conditions from the rest. So it's giving you more control over the data that's actually present in the PDB. And remember how I said, uh, I'm going to come back to this later in the talk, that you can find out um, structures where regions are missing. Suppose you do not want to play around with structures that have missing regions. Again, KB will show you uh, in the form of these grayed out regions, if there are any unobserved segments or unmodeled segments um, in any one particular instance of this protein so that you don't need to um, wor worry about it or work with it. Similarly, if you are only looking for apoforms of the protein, you do not want any ligand bound forms, these buttons are super helpful. So if these green buttons are on, this means these are all instances where there is any ligand bound to the protein. Whereas if these are grayed out, it means there are no ligands bound. So you can also differentiate between um, apple versus hollow forms. Next, moving on, um, we also have the ligands tab, which shows all the ligands observed in the same PDB entries as this protein. So all the ligands present in all of these different PDB entries you click on it and it will give you a list of the different ligands and it will also show you which are the other PDB IDs where this particular ligand is present. Moving down the page, it will also give you this view, which we call the Prod Vista view. And what it's actually showing you is the ligand binding sites. So it will give you an idea about which region of the protein um, are the ligands actually binding. And so continuing with that, if you also want to view superposed ligands and see exactly the binding sites in 3D, again, you can, you can click on this button and this is what it does. It'll show you all the proteins superposed and it'll show you the particular ligand binding sites as according to the structures already deposited in the PDB. So you can get an idea about if there are multiple ligand binding sites, um, if there are ligands which bind to the surface compared to um, say any particular pockets, et cetera, et cetera. So all of this is giving you more power to play around with the data, with information that's already present. Right, the next tab um, is the interactions tab. So this is giving you information about macromolecular interaction partners. So if your protein of interest is interacting with another protein in any of these uh, PDB entries, this tab will report this. So if you click on it, it's showing you the other proteins that interact with your protein of interest in any of these PDB IDs. 
And also as you go down the page, it will again give you the prod vista view where it's actually showing you the, the residues uh, which are important for the protein-protein interaction. So you get an idea about the interaction surface and the proteins, uh, sorry, the residues that are involved in the protein-protein interaction as well. The next tab is for annotations, which are additional annotations derived from KB partners. Uh, if you are interested in it, please click on the link and uh, you'll be taken to the list of the different databases which have partnered up with PDB, KB, and we also get annotations from them. For example, if it's a metal binding site, if there are known variants for this protein that can cause diseases. So all of these external annotations, we also show um, on, in this tab called the annotations tab. The similarity tab will report proteins that have more than 90% sequence identity to your protein of interest. So um, even if some of these may not have um, associated PDBs, or, uh, they will be reported here. So it'll also pull in the data from Uniprot as well, even if there are no structures in the PDB. And the final tab is the publications tab, of course, which lists all prim, uh, primary PDB publications. So you do not need to go to each of these 50 um, entries and then look for the publications, you will get the view right here. And also if there are any reviews that mention um, this particular protein, you will get the information right here. So I can go on about KB, but um, there's lots to lots to really play around with. And um, if you are interested, uh, we would love to talk to you more about KB and how you can use it in your research. But I have only been talking about experimental structures. What if you want to search not only experimental structures, but computational models as well? Can you do that? And the answer is yes. We have another resource, which is called the 3D Beacons. And this is actually a collaboration between many different model providers, of which PDBE is a member. We also have AlphaFold database. We have um, Model Archive, uh, SwissProt, uh, Swiss Model, sorry, Swiss Model, etc. So. Basically, what 3D Beacons does is it will give you an idea about where the models are, that is the URLs, the overall quality of the model will be reported, and also the context, that is the metadata, the species, the gene, all of this information will be available via 3D Beacons. We also have the 3D Beacons um, APIs, um, and you can access the information programmatically as well. Something very unique about the 3D beacons is, suppose you're working with a very novel protein and you do not have a Uniprot accession code, but you want to find computational models. You can also search using just the sequence. So there's an option for sequence search. So you can also um, put in your sequence of interest and find if there are any computational models that have already been reported for that particular protein. So what it actually shows you is how many experimentally determined structures are present, how many template-based models, or how many ab initio models are actually present there. So it'll give you a list of all of these. So you will get an idea about how many experimentally determined, and we also show you the link for accessing each of these models individually. You can also download the data directly from here. Um, also, if there are different regions of the protein that have been modeled using different softwares are um, present in the PDB, you get information about that as well. So this is a very um, comprehensive resource where you get information about experimental, um, experimentally available structures as well as computational models as well. So if you've never used this, uh, I would strongly suggest that you try it out and play around with it to really find how it can be useful to you. And again, we are always, always happy to get feedback. And the final part of my talk will be about, can you use information from an existing MD simulation to use as your own starting model? So one of the resources is mDeposit, which is an open platform um, to provide access to MD simulations. You can search right over here. Uh, using title, authors, and group names. And you can download trajectory files, extract structures. And in this case, the protein would be solvated, energy minimized, ions added. So you don't really need to prepare your structure 
um, for the simulation, you can either continue it or start a new simulation. But it's, um, we are also, we as in EMBL EBI are also part of the MDDB project. And I really want to end my talk on the MDDB project. So this is a, a unified database for MD simulations, but this is still a work in progress. Um, and we are partners um, of this particular project. Um, it includes seven partners, uh, multidisciplinary consortium for validated MD simulations. Uh, so the objectives of the MDDB project are to establish fair principles for MD data, to promote practices for generation and analysis of MD trajectories, uh, to design the technical infrastructure for a repository for simulation data, and to finally find a model a governance model for uh, a unified MD database. So yeah, uh, it's as I mentioned, this is still a work in progress, but we are uh, happy to be a part of it. Um, and I guess that would bring me to the end of my talk. And I hope you now understand that selecting the correct starting model is really important for a successful MD simulation. There are several factors that you should be aware of at the outset, um, which include confirmation of the protein, missing regions, presence of ligands, et cetera. It's important to be aware of resolution, which particular experimental method has been used to derive the structure and the fit between the experimental and model data. And also um, PDB, KB, and 3 db beacons are really useful resources to compare protein structures. And if you have not used them for your work, I highly recommend that you do so. Well, with that, um, if you would like to stay in touch, we are active on social media. We have um, our Twitter and LinkedIn uh, handles. So please follow us, connect with us. We are always very, very happy to hear from you, hear any feedback that you have. And if you could fill in this feedback form, uh, it would be really helpful uh, to let us know how we did. If there's something else you would like to hear about in the future, um, and if there's something we could have covered better. So thank you all so much for listening to me. And I think uh, we are all very happy to, to take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. So that China, maybe you could put in uh, in the chat uh, the link to the feedback, so it's easy for uh, people to click it. Yes, I can definitely. Because I cannot. Do, I was trying to do, but I realized that sure, I could I not. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and then uh, you can post to everybody, or you can just tell me. Okay, thank you very much for the nice presentation. Uh, we had uh, a question coming up uh, early from Er Ershed. Uh, and the question was, it is possible to reach the record stream for reviewing after use? But maybe I try to, um, but uh, I can try to uh, unmute the person if he can ask the question himself, so it might be clear. I try to unmute you. Let me know if you can speak or not. Uh, maybe he cannot speak because it doesn't uh, really react. Yeah. So do you speak? You can speak. No. So I mute it again. I don't know if you understand what he was aimed to because it's a little unclear to me. It is possible to reach the record stream for reviewing after use. This was at the beginning of your presentation after 20 minutes so roughly. Sorry, could you repeat that, Alessandra? I'm not sure. Yeah, I think it's a little. You can see also the question. I, in the see the question. I think. Um, but I could uh, not guess what was the background of the question. So then it's a little weak. Maybe uh, the person can put a, 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 try to amplify a little the question. Then we have another question How can we handle the ANISU value in the structure? Um, so 
I'm not sure what you mean by handle the ISO values. Um, I think it means how we can put in how we and yeah, I guess my guess, but it's an ano. I cannot. Maybe it was amplified. Uh, yeah. So I can maybe add one thing about yeah, this. Please go ahead. Um, in in our molecular view in MOLSAL, you can view the uncertainty and disorder of a protein structure. So maybe they're asking whether you can take that into account, similar to other validation metrics, um, to see which regions are the most flexible and so which ones you might uh, want to I, be about. Uh, no, not that I'm aware that you can do that in MOLSAL. Um, I think there's a button for B factors. Like factor, I think there's a button. Again, also has a lot of functionality. If you have not played around with it, have a play around with it. Um, it's really, really helpful. Uh, but again, there's a lot of different functionalities. Uh, I can't remember current currently if you have a functionality for an, an ISO U. Um, but yes, sure, I can I can check for it. I can play around with it and try to find that out. Yeah. Then, then there is a question of Mohammed. I will try to allow him to speak. Maybe he want to speak. He has several questions. Uh, please, you can. I allowed you to speak, if you can, or maybe you don't have the microphone. Uh, I guess he cannot speak. I try. Uh. No, he cannot speak. So we can go on with the question. So the question was, uh, if I model a missing loop using an homology modeling tools, is there any option on the PDBE to validate the model loop? loop? And also, can, I, can my published MD simulation be added to the MD PDB? And on what basis? So there are two questions, actually. So for the first part, if you have modeled a missing loop, um what you can do is we have something called the standalone validation server that you can just use not to submit structures, but to validate your structures. So um, you can use a standalone validation software just to upload your PDB or MMC file and get a report from us that will let, let you know if there are any obvious issues um, with your modeled region. And as for, can your published MD simulation be added to the MDDB? I think, yes, that is the ultimate aim of the MDDB. Uh, but as I mentioned, I think it's still a work in progress. I think um, Adam could probably have let, told us more about this if he was here. Uh, but I think currently, um, no. But hopefully in the future, you will be able to add your MD simulation data to the archive, to the MDDB, to the database. Okay, so then we can go on with the question. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, there is a question about what is the importance for metal ligand in the X-ray structure? <laughs> um, I am not an X-ray person, honestly. Uh, but sometimes I think metal ligands may be just a part of the uh, protein. That's how it has been purified maybe, um, or it may also be stabilizing for certain proteins. Um, or it may also be a part of any ligand um, that's present. So an importance of the metal ligand, if you call a ligand, um, I would say stability of the structure majorly, and also uh, crystallization conditions. So a protein may crystallize better at a higher concentration of particular ligand. So if if it, it likes that, so you know how cranky metal uh, like proteins are sometimes for crystallization. Oh, thank you very much. Then we have another question, how to choose and fix uh, alternate sites in PDB? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by fixing alternate sites. Uh, Sometimes if it's a crystal structure, you would have multiple confirmations. So 
you could have um, multiple occupancy. So one particular atom may be modeled at 0 0.5 occupancy. So that just means they have been able to solve the structure where there were multiple confirmations of that particular atom present. Say one is in one particular confirmation and other is at a different um, confirmation. So um, that's just how the, the protein crystallized maybe. So um, I'm not sure, Marcus, if that has an effect on running MD simulation or if you've come across this. So I, I guess sometimes there's an issue if, if there's a residue which has got multiple confirmations. I'm not sure all of the MD packages accept something like that and whether you have to choose a single confirmation. Um, in that case, I would go through the either the PDB structure or the MMSIF structure and look at which one you think is the most likely or that provides the most interesting information to start with. And then you can manually delete the, the atoms of the alternate confirmation. Um, and this could be a case, for example, if you're looking at things like a covalent inhibitor, there might be 50% of the residue is covalently bound to this inhibitor and the other 50% is not bound to the inhibitor. And you might just be interested in the one where the covalent link is present. Um, so it would really vary on a case by case basis, what would be the best alternate confirmation. Um, but yeah, lo looking in Molsa and, and trying to understand what relevance that, that confirmation might have. And then you're able to, to remove the, the atoms which you don't think you, you should begin the structure with. Oh, thank you very much. So then we have another following up question of MD. Minimizing the structure before a molecular dynamic simulation can resolve the issue of steric clashes in the starting structure. Marcus, do you want to? Um, yeah, I, I can uh, try and answer this question. So, so usually at the start of an MD simulation, you would do minimization to remove some of these steric clashes. Um, it depends on how, lar how large of an issue these steric clashes are, because sometimes energy mineralization, it only resolves some local clashes. If you have some very significant clashes, then then it might be an issue. Um, it, even though some of these will be resolved, um, it's worth bearing in mind that if you start with a structure which has a huge number of clashes to start with, it might be worse than a structure which has only very few to start with. So you want to really start with a structure which, which is better to begin with rather than trying to fix the problems during minimization. Oh, uh, thank you. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, that, that, that was it. Oh, thank you. And uh, there is a, a more general question, I think. Is there any scope to refine experimental crystal structure in the PDBE KB. No, there isn't. So KB, <laughs> all it does is pull the information from the PDB and shows you in a holistic manner. It's showing you information about all the structures that are already present. So you cannot, if you have a new experimental crystal structure, you cannot refine it using KB. You can use the validation software to sort of get an idea about if there are any outstanding issues in your structure that you can do another round of refinement to get a better model. But yeah, then you have to deposit it to the PDB. Thank you. Uh, then we have uh, several questions. Uh, we have another one of Metal, but I think you already answered. So we have covered already. Um, we have a question on, is there a place to submit protein structure generated completely by alpha fold? Will it be accepted on the database or experimental validation is needed in the PDB? No, I think you roughly answer with your thought, but you can uh, sure. maybe... Uh... We are an archive. PDB is an archive for experimentally determined structures. So any structure that you upload to the PDB um, will also have to be supported by experimental data, depending on the method that you have used to solve that structure. We do not accept computational models, no. 
Can I just add to that? We a few years ago we started a project called PDB IHM, um, and this aims to to fill that gap. So IHM stands for Integrated Hybrid Models. So where we take a variety of experimental and computational work, so people can deposit stru uh, structure with things like cross-linking mass spectrometry data or a small angle X-ray scattering. And they can submit to PDB IHM this data along with a computational structure or an experimental structure. So um, this is a, a way to kind of fill that gap. Um, it's still in quite an early stage, but hopefully in the future, uh, if we do have these kind of integrated models, um, people can submit their, uh, their their computational models as well. Yep. We also have the model archive, which is similar to the IHM that um, Marcus mentioned, yeah. Oh, then there is another question. Uh... In the 3D view of a superposed structure, I guess he referred to your presentation, that show ligands of a PDBE KB, does the ligand are already, uh, oh, sorry, does the lig, uh, does the ligand, no, I guess it's the ligand are already there or they are predicted ones? No, these are the ligands which are already present in structures that are deposited in the PDB. So KB does not um, deal with predicted ligands at all. Um, so these are, if there are 50 structures in the PDB for a particular protein, and maybe in these 50 um, PDB entries, there are ligands present. This is just showing those ligands and where they are mostly um, binding. If there are specific binding pockets, for that particular protein, or if they're binding maybe at different places. Yeah. And then, oh, thank you. We have a last question. Uh, if there, if there is no crystal structure available for a protein, how to choose or validate the protein model just to see, uh, for example, just to see the alpha fold model for MD? Um. I am not sure what... Yeah, I guess uh, uh, if there is no crystal structure available for the protein, for a protein, then how to choose or validate the protein model, for example, the alpha fold model for MD? I think, I guess, my guess is, but it's my interpretation that the question is, if I don't have an X-ray structure available, how I can, and there are models for this structure, can be alpha fold or whatever, how I can uh, choose among those models, how I can say that is the best one to start my molecular dynamic simulation. This is my interpretation. Uh, so and Sorry for the attendees if I interpret wrong. No, no. Uh, that's very helpful. <laughs> um, I, think, I think one of the ways is to go to the AlphaFold database that we have, which also have scores for different uh, predicted models. Uh, if you want to look at any scores to help you choose a, a starting model purely from AlphaFold. So we have, this is another one of our resources, the AlphaFold database uh, that you can, again, um, play around with, look at uh, if you are dealing with novel proteins that have no crystal structures. I have a final question that pop up now. Is there any cutoff resolution value for selecting a protein? Like one, 1 2.5? Marcus. I guess I guess they speak about X-ray, but that is my guess because cryo EM does not have. I think the best that's available. Uh, so if there's only one structure and it's relatively low resolution, but you really want to simulate that protein, then I guess you have to go with that one. Um, so, but I guess anything under about two would be ideal, but. I, there's no fixed rules and it, it depends on which region of the protein you're interested in. If if it's low resolution on, on the surface, but it's high resolution in the active site, then then that might be okay to have a lower resolution. Okay. So I think now we can, uh, we can close the section. I just have a, a last announcement and, and then I will ask, I will, uh, 
Let me see if I can share my slide. Uh, no, it's not working. Stop sharing. Sorry. Yes, so I have. Uh, I, I want to conclude this webinar section with just the final things that I want to announce. So uh, as a BioExcel, we are organizing a user-driven survey. So a survey where we can feel what people think of all our activity and also that can influence our user-driven development, but also our training, our events and everybody. So since I will be very happy if I've some of you could go to this survey and fill it up. I think this week is the last week that is possible. And that will help us a lot as a project. Thank you very much. Then I want to thank a lot our speaker, Sudashina, and also Marcus. Thank you very much for being with us, for answering to all the questions. And thank you all of you for the question and for being with us. And see you in the next occasion. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.